All right. So yes, welcome everyone to the first seminar in the 2021-2022 UCL Center for Applied Linguistics seminar series. Uh, we are very honored to have Professor Gregory Hadley, who's here from Niigata University, um, who has is going to talk to us about using grounded theory method in applied linguistics research. Um, I, I, I know Greg, uh, he contributed the absolutely brilliant chapter on grounded theory method in the book that I edited uh, with Heath Rose, uh, the Routledge Handbook uh, for, for uh, Routledge Handbook of Research Methods in Applied Linguistics. Um, so I certainly recommend that reading in addition to uh, other great works by Greg. Uh, there are links in the chat for you to access handouts for today's talk. Uh, so please do look for that. and and the links are working. So that's, we've got confirmation of that, great. Um, so just to get us started, um, a, a quick introduction um, about Greg. So he is professor of applied linguistics and Western cultural studies at Niigata University in Japan. He is a visiting fellow at Kellogg College at the University of Oxford, uh, where I know we do have some people here joining us from Kellogg for this talk. Uh, some of his works include English for Academic Purposes in Neoliberal Universities, A Critical Grounded Theory, that was with Springer in 2015, Grounded Theory in Applied Linguistics Research, A Practical Guide with Routledge in 2017, um, as well as contributions to the SAGE Handbook of Current Developments in Grounded Theory in 2019 and the Routledge Handbook in, in 2020. All right. Um, so, Greg, yeah, I, I won't take up any more time. Um, I can see that you're animations are working on your slides. So I think we are ready to go. I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Jim. And thank you all of you for coming to this seminar. I mean, some of you are up uh, very, very early in the morning, very, very late at night. Um, and I really appreciate that. Welcome to my office here in Japan. Um, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, actually, it's, it's not really easy to do a presentation on grounded theory. Uh, especially in li applied linguistics, because there are a lot of things that tend to work against uh, us in, in grounded theory as a, in, a, in the field of applied li linguistics. And I'd like to look at a few of those for a moment. Um, first of all, let's just say that we've got somebody who has, has written uh, a, a book, a grounded theory book uh, in the area of applied linguistics. And they've written the manuscript, they send it off to an editor somewhere. And what we'll end up getting oftentimes is, you know, the editors will say, what's this? You know, it looks dodgy and kind of like a Dalek. They'll be saying, reject, 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 because they, they, they don't understand where it's coming from and uh, how this often fits within the, the wider conversations that are going on in applied linguistics. So it's hard, uh, depending on the, uh, the venue, to actually get a grounded theory study published, even if it's done, shall we say, correctly. Then there's also the issue uh, of grad students who have some pretty fuzzy ideas about uh, research and grounded theory. And I've run into quite a few of them that will say, well, you know, I don't have any ideas, but I've heard of grounded theory. And if I can do grounded theory, it'll give me an idea on uh, what I can do with my research. So, you know, they, they, look at, they look out for grounded theory as something that, that's going to give them the ideas that they actually don't have. And that's oftentimes, you'll see that sort of thing within the writings of grounded theorists. This quote from uh, Kathy Urquhart, uh, she um, writes about her own graduate experience when she kind of didn't have a clear idea about what she wanted to do. Um, and so she uh, uh, go ahead and started tried to use grounded theory. And well, she, it, it worked out for her. Uh, she's a, a, a writer and researcher uh, in, I think it's um, uh, information, information science, I believe. Uh, and uh, she's well known, uh, a grounded theorist in her field. But it doesn't always work that way for other people. Uh, I remember one, one time I was at Oxford and a student said that he was going to be doing grounded theory and he told me what it is he was going to be doing. And, and I said, well, you know, that's really not grounded theory. And he said, well, you know, maybe it's not what others would call grounded theory, but I'm calling it grounded theory. Oh, no, no, no. And so it begins. Uh, what happens often is that when people don't follow the, the uh, procedures set out in, ground, in, in the grounded theory methodology, they end up getting drowned in data. And you'll, you'll see them coming with all of these interview transcripts and all of this material, and 
it's like, what do I do with now? I've got all this stuff and I have to analyze all of it. How do I make a theory out of this? And uh, the problem is, is sometimes they can't. So that's why oftentimes when uh, you have uh, applied linguistics uh, supervisors for PhDs, uh, having uh, students coming into their office saying that they want to do grounded theory, they're going to say, no, 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 you're not going to do grounded theory because I've had people in the past who said they were doing grounded theory and the viva was terrible. Uh, the, it took so much time and what they wrote was, well, not very good, right? Well, that's some of the things that uh, have kind of given grounded theory as a methodology a bad name uh, in applied linguistics. And there's also misunderstanding that has been, uh, you know, unintentionally uh, for, uh, passed around about grounded theory by other uh, uh, scholars. I mean, for example, at uh, one time in his past, uh, David Noonan had said that grounded theory was a type of ethnography. Anne Burns said it was a type of uh, uh, action research. You know, Kanagaraja said, you know, he just kind of liked saying grounded theory when he was writing about some of his things back in the year, back, back in the day. At the same time, we've, we've had uh, people who, in the field, um, Keith Richards, uh, Adrian Holiday, who, who've written about grounded theory to a certain degree in their work, but they've, they've not done it actually in their, in, their, in their practice. So what I want to do today is uh, I want to sort of pull out this uh, toolbox and uh, sort of spread it all out and, and uh, show you some of the bits and pieces, bits and bobs that goes into uh, making a grounded theory. Uh, you won't be able to learn everything in this one talk, but hopefully you'll be able to uh, get, as, as the, uh, the Jewish uh, historian Max de Mont had said, something that won't uh, seek to subvert what you uh, are already doing, not to convert you to a grounded theory religion, but to inform you, to, in to entertain you, and perhaps stimulate you towards uh, some new ideas. So welcome to this talk on using grounded theory and applied linguistics. So as we get started, let me give you a, a few preliminary questions. First of all, is the question of, you know, where does, you know, grounded theory come from, um, uh, some of the origins. And uh, as traumatizing as it can be, I'll give you the, 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 the sanitized version, uh, because uh, oftentimes when we look at how uh, things start out in academia, sometimes they can be brought, but we won't go there. Um, we'll start out with uh, the original, uh, the, what they call the originators of grounded theory. Uh, Barney Glazer uh, on the left, uh, Anselm Strauss on the right, two sociologists, uh, very well known uh, from the 1960s. Uh, they came together at the um, um, University of California in San Francisco, and they uh, together they wrote a, a book. They were medical. Uh, they they got into. Uh, they were sociologists before they got jobs in the nursing department, uh, and so they became medical sociologists. Uh, they wrote a book called "The Awareness of Dying," uh, that was based on this this methodology that they that they developed, and it was so good. In fact, that the doctors and nurses and patients who uh, had uh, worked in, in hospices and hospitals where people were dying would say, how did these two sociologists who don't have a, a medical background, how did, they, how did they pull this off? This is, this is really, really good. Um, and so what they did then was they then wrote this landmark book, uh, The Discovery of Grounded Theory, which explained uh, more in, in, in kind of a, a polemic form uh, what they did, although I would never recommend anyone to read this book to get ideas about how to do the methodology. Um, at this point, though, um, uh, in terms of sociological theory, uh, and, uh, and we're talking about sociological theory that has a, a qualitative uh, methodology behind it, uh, about if the bibliometric studies, up to 66% of the studies have been using uh, grounded theory either in its full form or some partial form. Grounded theory as a, a methodology is, is represented through, throughout, uh, especially the applied uh, social sciences and health, business and management, sociology, of course, organizational studies, counseling, uh, education. But um, the uh, number of studies in applied linguistics continue to be minimal. And that's always kind of interesting uh, to me. I'm, I've never been 
really sure why, but it's just had a hard sell. Everyone else is doing it, but applied linguistics is kind of sitting over there in the corner saying, mm, I'm not sure about this or something. But we'll, we'll, we'll try to work on that, uh, hopefully bit by bit with uh, presentations like this. Okay, so another question that needs to go into this is the notion of uh, some philosophical questions that go behind the notion of grounded theory. And one of these philosophical questions is, uh, what sort of theory is constructed through the grounded theory methodology? Because if you just say theory, I mean, there's, if you go through your uh, uh, philosophy of science uh, textbooks, there's a lot of different ways that the notion of theory can be constructed and still be considered scientific theories. Well, grounded theory at its core, in its most original form, would, I would say, would be what we would call a pragmatic theory. And uh, when I'm talking about a pragmatic theory, I'm drawing from the, uh, the, the, the philosophy of American pragmatism, uh, a time when philosophers had massive amounts of facial hair, such as uh, William James here. And um, he, he describes pragmatic theory as designed for the purposes of solving problems, facilitating action, stimulating deeper understanding about a certain uh, situation or issue. And that's a very important point because that does have a bearing on grounded theory. Now, American pragmatism, if we look at the sort of fa uh, family tree of thought that goes into the development of, of grounded theory itself, uh, you know, feed, fed into what was known as the Chicago School. Uh, Dewey, uh, the great uh, educator, uh, also was uh, connected to this uh, school of thought. Um, it also influenced um, Herbert Bloomer, uh, the founder of a of a, a philosophy or a, a sociological way of seeing things that lacked a methodology, really. Uh, these went into the influence on Anselm Strauss, uh, whereas Bloomer um, and a uh, very hard sort of a, a quantitative uh, background from the Columbia School, sociologists who did big data like Lazarusfeld and Merton, but went into uh, the influence of Glazer, who was uh, uh, a student at this school, together with uh, a very interpretative form of, uh, of reading texts, explication de text from, uh, from his time in studying in France. And these are some of the, the main, um, uh, well, streams of thought that went into Glazer and Strauss so that when they came together and created a methodology for studying uh, medical sociology, uh, they ended up calling it grounded theory. Today, it's often called classic. Uh, grounded theory. And you, you can see they, they describe uh, grounded theory as uh, being for empirical situations, should be understandable to sociologists and laymen alike. Well, it was back in the 60s, they, they used words like layman instead of uh, inclusive language, but they said most important, it works. It provides us with relevant predictions, explanations, interpretations, and applications. And uh, and even though he wasn't alive at the time, uh, William James would certainly be smiling and say, yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's the type of theory that I think is pragmatic. So going back now to T. Saul, Chris Broomfoot, uh, would, would, when he speaks about the, the heart of T. Saul, uh, and applied linguistics, he found that its strength is in its theoretical and empirical investigation of real world problems in which language is a central issue. So for me, I see that there are some, some good points here, some, some bridges of connection between some of the, the notions of developing pragmatic theory uh, from American pragmatism and embodied in uh, uh, the grounded theory methodology and uh, what some applied linguistics would see as uh, the, the core uh, stance uh, of applied linguistics. All right, well, it's time now for the old skeptical glasses to come on and say, oh, I don't know, come on, Hadley, this is sounding a little bit too good to be true, right? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, first of all, I mean, why are we making theory in applied social sciences? I mean, we're applied linguistics. We apply things, we don't make theories. You know, I mean, there's a Dornier, for example, lovely person would say, you know, you shouldn't be making theories about motivation. You know, you're, you know, don't, don't, don't mess with that. Let it, leave it to the experts in psychology and other things. And, you know, why are we making theories, right? Well, well okay, I'll get on my little soapbox, even though I'm not in London at the moment, right? And uh, I'd like you to think about this notion. Think about applied linguistics. It's kind of out there on the street, a bit homeless. 
holding out its hand, you know, just kind of waiting for psychology and education and sociology and other, and other fields to kind of feed us with new ideas so that we can go out and apply them. Well, I think, you know, can make, make the music swell to a crescendo slowly as I tell you this, but I think that we as applied linguists, we, we are in really, really special places around the world. We work with people and have access to informants in places and with people in language groups that, that researchers in sociology, education, and psychology could only dream about having access to. And we have insights. Many of us are, are multilingual, speaking two, three, four languages. We, we have things to say. We have contributions that we can make uh, from our perspective as, as uh, linguists uh, and applied linguists to, to these fields. And one way of being able to, instead of simply receiving and applying theirs towards education, we can take some of what we can learn from our fields and, and, and provide it for them uh, and our scholars in other fields. We can become part of the team where we're also giving as much as we're receiving. Okay, the sermon's over now, and so we'll move on. But I just uh, wanted to say that, that we shouldn't always think of ourselves as reci recipients, that we too can give back. I think the grounded theory is one way of being able to do that. Okay, another question then. So what's a grounded theory? This is a more difficult question than one might uh, realize, because if you, if you read the literature, especially the older literature, you see someone talking about a grounded theory, doing grounded theory, and then this grounded theory was done, and it goes back and forth and back and forth, and it's confusing. Um, so one of the weaknesses, shortcomings in the early years of grounded theory, in those wild and heady days of the 1960s, is that uh, they weren't as um, exact and as clear. Uh, about their nomenclature as we would have hoped them to have been. Um, and so uh, grounded theory, if you want to know what it is, well, it's two things. It's a product and a process. So in terms of product, well, that's what we were just talking about earlier. It's a thing that's made to do something. That would be the, the grounded, theory, uh, grounded theory as uh, a product. But a lot of the uh, uh, people today, a lot of scholars today, uh, will also see that grounded theory is a process, a way of doing. So you'll hear people talking about doing grounded theory. The methodology for making a grounded theory is that process. And there are some such as uh, uh, Tony uh, Bryant, uh, scholar in Leeds, who has written widely and is one of the, the foremost authorities uh, of grounded theory methodology. He's tried to distinguish GT uh, as an acronym for the, the grounded theory, the thing that's made, and GTM, the methodology for how to make a grounded theory. Uh, but still, people still slip up. I do too. Uh, but I try to uh, um, uh, refer to the methodology as GTM and the product itself as GT. And that's what I'll try to do today. But of course, there's not just one GTM. There's a whole family of, of methods and methodologies out there because, you know, you get, a, you know, if you get two scholars uh, on, on the same topic into a room over time, they're, you're, now you're going to have two schools and that's what you've had. You've got different ways of baking this cake. And here's just a, a few examples of that, uh, looking at this really basic family tree, classical grounded theory broke up eventually um, into what some would call Glazerian, although he calls his classic and true grounded theory, and Straussian, uh, another version that was kind of on the side, um, dimensional analysis. Uh, one of the most famous and widely used today is called Constructivist Grounded Theory by uh, Kathy Sharmaz. Another version called uh, Situational Analysis out there. Critical uh, Grounded Theory is out there trying to hold its own. There are different uh, uh, ways of going about this. And behind most of these are philosophical issues rather than methodological issues. Uh, but we don't have time to go into great detail about the differences between these. But it, it would be helpful just to kind of pull back for a second and at least talk about the uh, traditional methodology so we can get a better understanding of this, um, this notion of grounded theory in general terms. 
I mean, typically, if you're going to do your master's or your PhD or do a project, you know, you go out and you read theory, you do the readings of the of the topics, uh, you do all of those different uh, readings, to find out what people have been talking about, develop your research method, go out and collect data, and then you validate those findings and reflect it back to the established theory. Grounded theory tends to do it the other way. Uh, the methodology, and I'm going to give you a plain vanilla version of it now, starts out something like this. At the bottom, you start out in a very, very open-ended, open, -ended, open expl uh, explanation, and this will go for uh, quite some time until you start to get a, sort of a clearer idea of what might be going on, where you move into much more focused investigations, and then you have this back and forth and back and forth between generating a theory and, and the focused investigation uh, that um, uh, you're going to be continuing for quite some time before the uh, theory itself has been developed for uh, mass consumption. And this, and this goes into much more detail than what I had just showed you in the last slide. I mean, you'll see uh, that uh, you will have all sorts of things that will go on at each stage. Uh, open sampling is the notion that you will, um, in a general social arena, that you'll talk to anyone who will talk to you. Uh, to find out what's going on in that, that realm, uh, would be it a, a certain classroom or a university or an area of study. Um, I use something that's called repertory grids. Now, I'm not going to uh, bore you with my talks on repertory grids. Otherwise, well, those of you who are struggling to stay awake right now in South America, you won't stand a chance. But it's a really, really interesting uh, way of cutting off a lot of time in the open investigation for finding out what people are thinking in a certain area. Uh, but a lot of this is exploratory with open uh, questioning, uh, interviewing, observations, and the writing of lots of memos. It then moves on to something that is called theoretical sampling, where you start to look for uh, more and more people who can tell you about some of the codes and concepts that you're starting to develop. You don't look for people per se, but you, you have, now you have a group of codes and concepts uh, of things that people are doing, and you look for people anywhere that can tell you about these types of activities. Uh, th and, this, and, and it's at this time that you begin to start moving towards looking for scholarly literature that will tell you more about what people are telling you in the field. Instead of the other way, of, you know, finding out some things in the literature, and then going out and asking people about it, and hey, what do you know, I found out exactly what was in the, the literature, it's the opposite of you kind of will work with people and find out what their concerns are. And then you look for the, uh, scholarly literature that addresses uh, people who are also studying those things. Now that can also open the door for uh, a very much of an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary study because sometimes uh, you'll find that people will be talking about issues from different fields. Just as an example, in that uh, book that I did on e, um, English for academic purposes in neoliberal universities, I found that a lot of very helpful literature for understanding the lives and the struggles and the difficulties of EAP teachers could be found in the literature of nurses uh, who were dealing with very much the same sorts of issues as in different countries, uh, their hospitals were becoming more and more increasingly turned into businesses. Uh, that needed to raise money because of the lack of uh, government support going in due to neoliberal government policies. So anyway, um, other, other uh, issues with developing um, a, a, the a theory, uh, they're called oftentimes conceptual categories. They're much bigger and they're more abstract. Uh, there's all sorts of research that will go in with in terms of, of um, uh, additional interviews. They're continuing to write uh, memos uh, all through this time. Uh, so let's look at some of this in a little bit more uh, detail to give you a, a closer idea of what goes into uh, developing a grounded theory. Okay, we'll, so we'll start with this open explanation. So uh, in open explanation, uh, a, a lot of what happens at this, at this point is you'll have a data collection event, and that can be uh, either, especially in the beginning, um, very beginning, uh, you'll start with observation and you'll take notes about what you're seeing in this certain area. And you'll have a written summary about that. Uh, you'll write memos uh, about what you've done. Uh, then you may uh, do something, and I'll explain all of these things in more detail as we go on, uh, to code 
what you have written in your notes, your summary. You'll want to then to move into a start to maybe to interview a few, few people after you've developed some ideas. And you would, if, if you're allowed to, to transcribe, uh, to, to, to uh, inter, uh, sorry, to record the interview, and then you would like to transcribe that so that you can start to code that and to study that and, and break that up into um, uh, smaller bits for further analysis. This will give you working analysis, uh, working hypotheses and new questions and new sampling decisions for later on. Well, let's look a little bit more at this. So if you're just starting out in a grounded theory a study, you've got all the permission to do it. You've got sort of a general field uh, area that you want to look at. Uh, you're going to start out with observation. And observation would be, for example, you've got a group of students that uh, you have, and you go in and they're doing some stuff that you don't understand. And you ask, uh, like, uh, all right, what's, what's, what's going on here? What's going on? You just kind of watching and seeing what's, what's going on in the situation. Okay. You hit that hit that wall of what's going on here. You're going to need to back out and start to externalize your internal beliefs. Okay, what that what that entails first of all is for you to, you know, when you first saw this thing that piqued your interest in the class, um, you think, hmm. Immediately, there's going to be in the back of your mind some things. Ah, oh, maybe it's this, maybe that. You should sit down, and on paper write down. Maybe it works oftentimes out like this to make a mental interview with yourself. Someone's interviewing you about what you saw and what do you think is happening and what's the reasons, the causes and the consequences. And you write that all out. And then you keep that, you just, but you put it aside because that might be right. But without externalizing it, it's going to kind of, kind of, influence what your your your, your um, interpretations your analyses and your questions you want to put that over there on the side and practice something what uh, the grounded theorist uh, uh, Karen Henwood would say theoretical agno agnosticism you think yeah this might be right but it might be wrong I, I might be missing something I don't know but you don't throw it away you keep it there and as you continue to start doing your analysis over time, you might, uh, you know, go back and look and say, well, you know, is my, am I still just kind of doing the same thing that I thought before? Or is like, wow, you know, this is different than what I thought before. Okay. And, oh, this, this seems to be very similar to what I thought before. You, you go back and forth with this a little bit uh, over, over time. This is something that I'll touch on a little bit later called um, constant comparison. But you do this first. You get all that stuff out on paper somewhere, you kind of put it aside, you can relax, it's not going anywhere. And then you can then go once more back to the classroom and say, okay, what's going on here? And when you when you ask this question, you're going to be perhaps observing and taking notes about what are the people doing? Now, for example, you wouldn't, uh, let's say, went into one of my, my classes and all the students are sleeping. No, that's not true, I'm just teasing. But if it went in and all the students are sleeping, I would have I would written, all the students are sleeping in my class. I would not write, my students are so demotivated. That, that's an interpretation. You focus on what people are doing, what you can see, what you can hear, what are the actions or ideas that the people are taking for granted. And then you might want to point, the, see if you can identify what common problems are coming up. If they tell you, or if you see them, or if you're encountering them. So you focus on the empirical, especially in the very beginning. And um, when it comes to this, you may want to, you know, um, have uh, something like this, uh, which I've developed, you know, for my for my research, where you can write down your notes uh, for your observations. Uh, also, you can use these for um, interviews as well. If you say, "Well, I'd like to interview you," I says, "Yeah, but I don't want you to. I don't want you to to uh, record me." So, okay, okay. Then at least you can have something where you can write down a summary of the interview later on. But something like this that would you be able to write things down. And then on the side, you'll put these codes, which I'll touch on a little bit more later. Uh, and then, so you would do something like that. And then with your um, observation, you'd have something like this, where you know, you've got your date and time and place and talk about uh, what, you, what was done. Uh, and you can underline different parts of this to start to code what other people could see and hear just along with you at this stage, you think, well, this is not very interesting. Well, it, it's important that you don't start out 
with your biases and interpreting something. You start out with trying to focus on what's going on here. And then at the bottom of these, you can have some notes about possible questions or possible ideas that you want to follow through on. And as you start to make these sorts of uh, notes and memos and, and uh, oh, sorry, uh, codes, you'll want to write memos of any good ideas that pop into your mind. This is the place where you can, you know, if that you have that speculation or that is something that might be interpretive, you can start to write those things down somewhere and keep them so you don't lose them because there might be something there, there might not be. But you continue to go ahead and you write those ideas and then if you have a space for some future action about what, what would you like to uh, do more to find out more about whether this is uh, the, these hunches, these observations, uh, you know, are, if they're meaningful or not. And so you, you keep these memos. The heart of grounded theory is less coding and it's more writing memos. And most people don't realize that. People will try to break up their data and they don't write any memos. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work at all. Okay, so after you've done observation of a few times, you've got some of this uh, stuff, uh, data that you've uh, already started to develop, you'll, you'll want to move into interviews to ask people about what's going on. And again, you may need to use a, a, an interview summary, or you could uh, make a, uh, if you can, interview and then uh, turn them into uh, transcripts. And uh, there's lots of different methods for making transcripts. Uh, one of them that I've been using recently to cut off time for myself is that after I've recorded an interview, I'll put it into a, a video uh, software that I have and just put a picture in it. And then I'll uh, upload that video to YouTube in my YouTube account in my, my private settings. Wait a while for YouTube to make a, um, a transcript of that. Then I'll take it, take it, I'll download it off of uh, YouTube. And there's a, a few sites out there that you can open up the, um, uh, the file that has the uh, the, the, the um, subtitles, you can put it up there and it'll, the, the, the site will then strip out all of the time markings and everything. And you've got that. And then you can listen to the interview again and put things in and fix, fix the, the mistakes that are there, but it cuts off a lot of time and it still gives you the opportunity to really listen and attend to what the people are saying, because that's an important part. You want to stop in the middle of the interview and write some memos about, oh, this seems to be really important as you make the transcript, and then later on you can code it. Now, when you're conducting an interview, you'll want to ask things like, um, uh, in the beginning for the exploration, uh, to tell them what a, a good day is like, or what's, what's, ha what's are things like when you're having a bad day? What's a problem that you're often having, say, for example, in your classes? And what do you do to try to get around and solve this? You see, this is getting back to that pragmatic theory of, um, you know, that's dealing with uh, issues in a, a social social uh, environment. Okay, so you've got this, just to see, I wanted to put that back in your mind to see what's going on with this, right? So coding, right? I've talked about it a lot and um, maybe most of you or some, most some of you I'm sure will know what I'm gonna talk about with this. But, um, in terms of coding, uh, starting out uh, in the uh, back in the day when students asked uh, Glazer and Strauss what coding was all about, well, we ended up getting different answers for them. Um, Glazer said, coding reflects the empirical reality. He believed that if you got the right method right, anybody who coded the material uh, anywhere would get more or less the same thing. Strauss, on the, other, on the other side, said that social reality emerges from constantly changing social interactions in American pragmatists. These guys were working from two very different philosophical backgrounds, and they didn't really think about that uh, when they got together. They didn't really talk about that. But what ended up happening is because they had different philosophical backgrounds, they, start, they stopped getting along, you know, and, and they went their separate ways. Now, the reason why that's important is because when you're doing grounded theory, if you get the chance to do it in your PhD, for example, you need to make sure that you and your PhD supervisors are working from the same sort of uh, philosophical backgrounds, or at least that you understand where each of you stand on that. So philosophy is vital. One of the most of the problems that have gone on with why grounded theory hasn't been accepted in applied list linguistics as much, uh, and why uh, people misunderstand it is because they're operating from assumptions that their their, their way of seeing things, their philosophical. Uh, beliefs are what everyone else 
is believing and they get upset when they're disappointed in that. And so that's why one of the uh, files that uh, I sent to you is something that I, I think that you should really take some time to work at, not now, later on. If we were doing a, a right proper grounded work theory workshop, we would do it together. But there will be a, a questionnaire where you can do that, fill it out and look at the, um, the uh, way to uh, calculate the score at the end. And this will help you to identify uh, something around your, uh, your philosophy of science, uh, where you seem to be operating in um, an interconnected network of different ways of, of construing uh, the, the reality and research. And then this will also help to open your minds up to when you're listening to someone giving a presentation or you're listening to your PhD supervisor, you think, oh, okay, okay, so this person's got some assumptions that are pointing in this direction. And you'll need to show how to make the connections between where you're at and where he or she are at. Uh, and this is vitally important. I think grounded theory uh, as a as a, the the community of methodologists would have done far better if they had done something like this earlier on. Anyway, that's there for you. Okay, coding. Here's a way that I uh, explain coding to help people understand what it's like. Think about go to the um, University College London or you go to Oxford and you go into one of the great libraries and you find one of these ancient manuscripts, right? It's very ancient, right? And you'll notice that uh, with this ancient manuscript um, that uh, people uh, have kind of maybe marked off areas or, or maybe they've, they've, they've put little subtitles above things. If you look, for example, like the um, uh, authorized version of the Bible, the King James Bible, they call it the States, you'll see all these different summaries uh, over these different parts. Those weren't there originally, right? But someone put them there, okay? Those are codes, actually. I mean, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Christopher Columbus, uh, was reading this manuscript before he decided to go over and pillage the new world. And as you can see, he's got written there on the side, these different uh, short summaries, these short notes, uh, pictures and graphs and ideas that, that have come to his mind as he's been reading this. It's basically coding. And so what I'm, I'll, I will say is there's nothing really new about grounded theory. There's practices and, and ways of, of studying that have been around as long as Socrates and Herodotus. Uh, and it's just as, as in the issues of critical thinking and studying things that are out in the field in a more method, uh, sort of uh, methodical manner. Now, one way that's very helpful, especially, especially in the time of open coding, uh, the very exploratory time, is that you should try to think in terms of gerunds for describing actions as much as possible. This pulls you away from judgmental uh, uh, codes, because in the beginning, you don't want to keep constantly uh, keep forcing people to fit within your system. You need to have something that works uh, in a way that you're still looking at the actions and the activities, the words, things that are being said. Gerunds are very important at this time. Okay, so getting back to this, you've uh, had a collection event where you've had a summary or some observation notes. You may have had an interview, you've transcribed it. You've been putting in some open codes as as um, uh, gerunds. Uh, you've written memos about some of the codes. What does this code mean? Uh, what is this I person talking about here? And you've got new ideas. And then you move on to the next one and you do it again. But you'll use any of the codes that you have made from the first event in the second event if they fit. And of course, you'll develop new ones. And so you begin, and then from that interview, you'll get new ideas, new memos, uh, and, and uh, new ways of moving forward. So each interview, um, each collection event takes you a little bit closer and closer to something that, uh, well, will help you to get a better understanding of what's going on. And this is why you shouldn't like do uh, 10, 15, 20 interviews and then start coding because you're going to be asking people more or less the same questions over and over and over. And you're not going to get, you're not going to move forward. It's best as much as possible to work with one event as a, at a time and move forward. Because if you don't do it, you're going to be buried in data. I guarantee you it'll happen and you won't be able to make that progress. Right. So we've got this process here of, of uh, moving up to um, different levels. Uh, over time, probably after about 10 or, uh, or so interviews, data collection events on the open coding level, you're going to have plenty of codes, plenty of of memos, plenty of ideas for getting a, a more focused idea about 
what you're going to be, uh, what this study seems to be about. And so that's when you'll, that's when you'll start to move into accessing scholarly literature. Grounded theory treaches, uh, uh, treats scholarly literature not as a way of validating what you've done, it treats it as another informant, another research informant. These people were thinking about this topic too. And so you code your scholarly literature and you fit it into the developing framework. And let me show you what I mean by this. This is a, an interview that was, um, uh, these are the open codes and there's a lot of them. And it's, a, it's kind of a mess, it's a messy process. But after, ta after time, you will take many of these open codes, not all of them, but you'll start to put them into different groups. And then uh, above, above those groups, you'll put a, a label, a more general label that will um, encapsulate those things. They're still in there, you see? And then so after you've done uh, this, this focused coding stage, it's the same interview, but these are the uh, are the focused codes. And there's no need to worry. I mean, the open codes are still in there. They're still in there, and you've got in, you've got uh, memos explaining what those um, uh, other codes meant and information about that. And you'll write a memo about each of these um, focused codes to explain what they mean and explain how the how the open codes that go into making it how they relate to each other. So it's getting more complex now, isn't it? And then you'll have time also where you'll want to graph out some of these different uh, focused codes into higher order categories. And you'll want to show uh, over time after you've done further investigation, how do they interact with each other? And you'll write about those things. And these, these sorts of memos are actually quite important because at the time at which you're, when you're doing these sorts of things, you're actually writing parts of your PhD thesis right then, or parts of your of the paper or other things. And I'll show you some examples of that. Well, and I'll try to move on quickly. We started a little bit late, so we'll try to um, give me a little bit of time to go a bit later. But one of the nice things about grounded theory is that once you start getting to this stage, you are, you're actually writing uh, your work as you, as you go on. So there's lots of levels of coding. You've got the open coding, very descriptive. It's not enough, of course. But substantive coding or focused coding is where you start to put those into groups. Then you get them into these, these codes into more abstract groups. And over time, it all contributes to the support of a grounded theory. Now, someone's going to say, you know, dang, Greg, this is a lot of work, you know, and uh, how, much, how much do I have to do before I finally get a grounded theory? Well, uh, Ian Day, who wrote a, a very good book, Grounding Grounded Theory, um, had uh, a very nice way of discussing this called theoretical sufficiency. And basically, this is what, you're, what, I, what it's like. So when you're out there collecting data and interviewing people, and you're finding it more and more difficult to get something new. Now, you've got to work hard to get it. And, you know, most of the time you're talking to somebody uh, and asking them questions, it's like, oh, yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Oh, this is new. But you had to work a lot harder to get to, get to that point. When you find that you're digging a lot more to get something that's well, it's good and useful, but it, it's not vital, that's when you've reached theoretical sufficiency. You shouldn't be looking at a, you know, a unified theory of everything. You're talking about a grounded theory about what people do and say and how they deal with issues within a certain uh, specific uh, domain that's developed over the time after a movie you move from open uh, exploration to more focused uh, forms of exploration. So this is kind of what it will look like in, in the end, <clears throat> where you have all of this stuff from the empirical world that's gone up. It's getting a little bit more uh, descriptive, interpretive through focused codes, a little uh, quite a bit more um, uh, conceptual when you develop these higher categories. You have explanations of how they interact with each other. And then over time, you have a, a core category. If you want to think of it in one way, um, think of the core category, which will be oftentimes be the most abstract sounding as the title of a book, the categories as the chapters, and the focused codes as subsections. So, um, you know, the, the grounded theory of this might be, you know, the empire strikes back, rather, um, you know, abstract. It wouldn't be, you know, Darth Vader is Luke's father. It, 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 it's not descriptive at this point. So let's look at uh, that as we move on th uh, through this. Just wanted to fix this notion in your mind again, that 
as I talk about this, I want to remind you that there's a problem we have sometimes with process thinking when it comes to doing research, okay? And it's like, we think, okay, if I follow this process for doing grounded theory, just like making sausages, I can bang, 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 I can pump out that grounded theory. And you can't do this that way. I'm telling you about the procedures, but uh, there's a, a, a critical theorist by the name of Max Horkheimer, which does kind of sound something like it's related to sausage making for some reason. But anyway, he, he says that the problem with process thinking is that um, people think that the activity will produce the knowledge. The activity will produce the insight. And that's not necessarily the case. You are the core processor. These processes that I've been uh, telling you about helps you to focus your mind, but you still need what uh, the grounded theorists call theoretical sensitivity. And to develop that, you need to be able to read a lot of things in your field, but you also need to take time to read things like literature, fiction, uh, things that discuss the deep aspects of the human experience, biographies. Uh, you need to read those. If you don't do it before doing the grounded theory, then you're, it's too late. You need to be a reader, a deep reader, and, and, and to broaden your mind. Uh, you, that can also be done through travel. And it can also be done through learning a second language or a third language or a fourth language like you there. So the sensitivity you have to this empirical world is developed before you do the grounded theory. And the grounded theory methodology helps you to uh, pace yourself to do the job. So, um, Kathy Sharmez, who's uh, uh, just passed away last year, unfortunately, uh, uh, says that a grounded theory is still something that's created uh, between you and the people in the world. She sees reality as a social construction and that it's the theories are a process. It's, she sees life as a, or the thing is a, as a process of grounded theorization, that the theories that you develop will be constantly added to and slightly modified as new information comes through. And the important point though in, in this is that these are constructed, they're built from what's going on, but they're not made up. They're not just made up out of your mind. You're constantly interacting between uh, people and events to get a better idea about what seems to be going on in the situation. Think of it like this. <clears throat> you go off walking by the beach or by a fishing port and there's a net. And <clears throat> you pick up that net and you pull it up. Okay, what you've got in your hand right there is probably a grounded theory. And all these other interconnected knots and the things are, are things that have gone into that. But somebody else, could pick up another part of that net and it, it'll have some interaction and connections with what you've got, but it, it may seem to be uh, moving in a slightly different direction. And that's okay because the internet, the, the, the net of, of social interaction and human construction is such that it's, there will be places that will have some areas in common. It doesn't invalidate what you have found and it doesn't invalidate what they have developed either. So uh, thinking of a net, Maybe a helpful way of keeping you from saying, I've got to get it, you know, the right way 100% all the time. Okay, time for some pushback then from some uh, folks, you know, let's say one thing is like, well, Hadley, how do we know that your grounded theory is not simply a very complicated version of bias confirmation? You know, I keep seeing all these, you know, um, uh, patterns and things and well, you know, and then I start seeing the patterns everywhere, right? Well, Constant comparison is the, uh, the means that helps you to get through this. It's basically a form of Socratic thinking and it takes place in an iterative framework. Constant comparison means that while you start doing open exploration and you move through that and you move up through focused in, 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 uh, investigation and your, your readings and the theory generation, that while you're going through this, yes, you're gonna start seeing patterns. And the second you start seeing patterns, you have to stop and say, how can I break this pattern? Where's the exception to the rule? Where, where are people not doing this? Can I find somebody who will tell me why I'm wrong? And you have to continually do that because the, your brain is going to want to stop struggling to figure things out. And once there's a certain pattern there, your brain's gonna give you a big dopamine rush and you're not gonna to want to look at, you say, oh, I, I, now I understand it all. Probably not. 
you need to break your own theory because if you don't break your theory, somebody else will definitely when you get when you put it out in the field. And constant comparison is that process of yes, these 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 things do seem to be the same. They seem to be similar, moving in the same direction, but this doesn't. Okay, that's just as important because that defines the edges of these things that, that are happening at the same time. But it also helps people to see uh, the, 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 the limitations of your theory. And it also can help you to break things that are too simplistic so you can give it much more complexity. Constant comparison is, is key. Okay, well, then you've got people say, well, you know, uh, how do you, you know, I'm, I'm into falsification. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big popper man. So uh, how, how do I evaluate grounded theories? It doesn't seem to be falsifiable. Well, um, this again goes back to that, uh, those philosophical questions, but um, these are some of the um, different ways that um, um, uh, Kathy Sharma has suggested that you can look at a grounded theory to evaluate it. How useful is it? Um, is it believable? Uh, you see the grounded theories are written usually first and foremost to people that are in that area. Uh, they can be abstracted further up to a, a higher level of theory. Most people don't do it, uh, have, but it can be done. Uh, does it resonate with you? Now, sometimes a person will say, well, this theory doesn't mean anything at all to me. Says, do you have anything to do with in that area? Well, no. Well, maybe it doesn't resonate because you're not part of that social arena. But if you're part of that social ring, it's like, nah, you know, it's got some good points to it, but no, 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 it's, it doesn't fit. Well, okay, then the, the, you need to go back, go out and make sure that you're uh, trying to really understand that. And is it original? You know, does it connect with previous studies? Does it connect with other aspects that are going on out there? Because um, you, when we look at a, a granted theory, it's not always something that's like totally brand new that no one's ever thought of you're going to be accessing different literature, uh, scholarly sources, you're going to be connecting that and expanding that. And that expansion and that new perspective is a, a major contribution. Well, then I, I remember once when I was at Oxford, I was talking to a very famous person um, and um, he's written lots of things that he doesn't, he doesn't like grounded theory. And we were eating chips and drinking wine. And he just said, well, isn't grounded theory just another term for qualitative research and then walked off in an abstracted air. And I was like, going, I was going to say no, but he didn't, it really wasn't a question. Uh, and well, so no, the answer is no. Um, now, a lot of um, qualitative research methodologies do use coding. They do take memos. They do use some of the, the, the methods and techniques of grounded theory, but it's what they do with it that's important. Phenomenology is focused on the life world, the lived experience. Uh, if you re read a good ph phenomenological work, you will feel like you have lived in that person's soul. Ethnography is into thick description, where we, you feel like you've actually seen uh, the place, uh, the, the group of people in your mind. Action research, uh, may, you may code and you may interview, you may uh, write memos, but it's a problem solutions uh, uh, methodology. You're looking to solve specific problems in your, in your uh, classroom, for example. Uh, the, specific, the specificity of uh, case studies is really, really helpful, uh, but uh, it, it has a different point. Grounded theory has developed um, that's to develop a, uh, a plausible theory about what's going on in uh, a certain area of human activity, be it in your classroom, uh, your, your university or school. Now, certainly there are people who are trying to mix grounded theory with phenomenology and ethnography. And Kathy Sharmaz, a constructivist grounded theorist, has taken lots of elements of phenomenology and ethnography. But especially if you're starting out uh, with grounded theory brand new, it's best to stick with the pragmatic theory Later on, as you get more advanced, you may want to pull in some other textures for something, but it's the it's the goal of, of the research that's different. And as uh, Jim had mentioned earlier, um, uh, if you want to know more about the differences in those um, um, uh, qualitative uh, methodologies, here there's uh, the, uh, a book with him and uh, um, Heath Rose. Um, uh, Call now, operators are standing by, and a free uh, set of Ginsu knives with the first five callers.
anyway, you need to choose wisely when I'm saying with your, with your research. Uh, you can't just say, I'm going to do grounded theory when actually what you really should have done was a quantitative. You need, really need to think about the, the whole, uh, what, you, what you want to do. And it may be that a grounded theory is, is just um, not the fit for what you want to do. Um, think about it. Grounded theory is not the, it's, it's just one methodology. It sounds cool. I'm doing grounded theory. It's like, ooh, but, but it may not be what you need to be doing to do your research. So writing up a grounded theory, how do you do that? Usually the, in a, a big grounded theory, you readers are typically going to see something like this, but you need to adjust all, all this data and everything that you've collected, this whole theory, it's usually too big. So you'll need to think about your venue. So for example, um, if you're going to write for, oh, let's say uh, um, you know, a presentation or a short paper, you may be able to only focus on um, uh, a focused code uh, and some open codes and some of the things that are going on there, uh, because this will give you enough for about 4,000 words or so. However, you still need to talk about the core category uh, and the main category and, and how, the, how those relate to that, to let them know there is a bigger theory out there. When it comes then to something of a nature of uh, this, this would be probably good for uh, something like, um, you know, a chapter or a long paper where you can still go into greater detail on some important aspect of a branch of the theory, but you still need to show how these other categories and core categories briefly are connected to this. And so, of course, finally, then you will be able to do something like this for a PhD thesis or for a book. But even though as you do this sort of thing, you, and if the reader may see primarily this, you still need to drill down to your categories, to your focused codes, and to pull back some quotes and, and, and information so people can better understand the codes and the categories. Otherwise, they may be too abstract for you to understand. Okay. One other point. Um, by the way, that's not me. That's static's not me. But um, um, for applied linguistics, uh, Philip Durant uh, has said that you know, the, uh, academic writing and applied linguistics tends to focus upon these sorts of values. He, he did a, a really great corpus study of, a, of academic writing, of pieces of academic writing in applied linguistics, and he came up with these, these points. So even when, though you have developed your grounded theory, you don't want to just present it like this paragraph. You're going to still need to flip it. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, literature that you've studied will be presented in the beginning uh, or near the beginning, the methodology that you went through and, and all of those different things and will be uh, presented so you can show how your theory is connected to the wider conversations going on in applied linguistics. So you still have to recontextualize what you've collected to fit uh, within the way that applied linguists understand things. And this is probably one of the reasons why grounded theory has had uh, poor uh, reception because people have just said, well, here it is. I mean, don't you understand? And they said, no. And um, well, there you go. This is something that it needs to be done. Okay. Some examples of grounded theory and applied linguistics, big ones. Uh, Rose Senior, uh, I think hers is probably the first book that, that uh, came out that used grounded theory in a way. And it's an, a wonderful book about uh, language teaching and the lives of teachers. Uh, Jim mentioned this book earlier. Um, and um, it's made me extremely unpopular in some uh, neoliberal universities in the UK. Um, I have to kind of watch myself, but no, not, not really. But it's, this, this actually quite, caused quite a stir with EAP teachers because they were able to read this and say, hang on, now I'm seeing these things going on where I didn't see them before, but I see them now. And that's the sign that theory is working. Uh, but uh, in the, um, the file, one of the files that uh, uh, was uh, sent in those links has uh, a couple of links to a grounded theory that I'm developing right now in the area of um, extensive reading. One of them is a, a longer one. It's the actual uh, presentation. And it's about 40 minutes long because it has the introduction and it has questions. The other one's a shorter, compact, uh, more of a uh, you know produced just as that. Um, uh, sort of thing. So there's a long one or a short one, depending on the time. But 
I'd like you to watch that because that, that will give you an idea of a grounded theory that's kind of halfway done. You may want to, what I do is I'll sometimes present what I've got so far, and that's a way to constantly compare. If I'm getting a lot of pushback, then I know that I've, I'm, I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction. I need to go back and, and, and study again. But you'll also see uh, in those uh, uh, ways that lots of data and thoughts from different fields are being pulled in to gain what I believe to be a, a better or at least a, a helpful understanding of what's going on in the classes of extensive reading and what teachers might be able to do to use the social processes described uh, to um, help students get a better experience. So uh, those are both on YouTube. Um, and you could, if you can't find the file, you can just type uh, Gregory Hadley, extensive reading, grounded theory, and I'm sure you'll find it. Anyway, it's there for you if you're interested. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up because uh, we're just, you know, we're getting close to, to the end. And I'd like to say, that grounded theory is not magic. There's no Harry Pottery going on in this. Grounded theory is, as a term, used to describe either as a methodology or the end product. So there's GT and GTM. It's used for exploring, not confirming. And I haven't gone into this in great detail, but it can use qualitative and quantitative data. There's a lady by the name of Elizabeth Creamer right now who's writing a, who's written a book on mixed methods grounded theory. Uh, and um, it started out in the beginning, grounded theory was supposed to be mixed methods, but most people did qualitative research. And so it's finally now people are starting to bring in uh, a mixed method approach to it. Uh, it can use both. It's a disciplined and systematic uh, system. You know, if you follow the procedure with your, the with your theoretical sensitivity, it can help to pace you so you don't drown yourself in data. However, grounded theory is not a collection of codes. I've got a lot of codes, so I've got a grounded theory. Nope, 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 nope. Those codes are basically now building blocks by which you build the theory. It's not an, ana an analysis of themes. Grounded theory is not thematic analysis. It's not going to give you a research idea when you don't know what to do. So you can't run into this and say, ah, teacher, I'm going to do grounded theory. Why? Because grounded theory. Nope, doesn't work that way. Uh, and it's not going to give you a PhD uh, just, just because you do it. You can't go out and like kick a tree and five people are going to fall out of the tree and they're going to tell you stuff and you, oh, now I've got, now I know what I'm going to do for my PhD. And no, it just won't do that. So uh, it, you need to have something going on, some grist for the mill before you uh, try to use it. The pros, I mean, the pros to it is that um, it does add a lot of rigor to qualitative research. In, in the years past, qualitative research, if I were to use a, maybe a, a Catholic metaphor, was something of the nature of, you know, I've got this data and I go behind the curtain and with the ringing of a bell, I would say, hey, presto, here's my theory. And you say, how did that happen? Well, don't ask that. Grounded theory allows you to be able to uh, see the processes by which a person has tried to analyze. You've got your memos, you've got your transcripts, you've got everything set up there. And it, it makes it much more um, um, transparent. The theories themselves can be very po powerful. Uh, you'll find someone after you've been developing your theory, though, if you ask and present it, you might get this sort of situation where someone will say, I never thought of that before, but that works. That really works. Uh, then, you, then you know that your grounded theory has, has um, hit pay dirt. Um, it can transform the way you do research because you're then not just simply stuck with following out the, you know, what's going on just in your field. You'll be challenged to look out and to find out what other people are thinking and doing that has something to do with, um, uh, with what we do as applied linguists. But I still think that uh, applied linguists and second language uh, acquisition researchers can make, we can and we should be making more um, uh, uh, contributions. But grounded theory is time consuming and it's hard. And it's not recommended for someone who's just starting out doing research. If you're a master's student and you're just learning how to do your first big research project, gr grounded theory is, is an advanced methodology it's probably best to do something qualitative, uh, perhaps somewhat simpler 
So you can learn how to do interviewing. You can learn how to do these other different sorts of methods and methodologies before you do something bigger as a grounded theory. And even if you're an expert researcher and you haven't done grounded theory before, it takes a while to begin to change your way of uh, interacting with data so that you can start to code uh, and to memo and to develop that discipline of doing memos and, and of connecting things. And it can be expensive, if, especially if you decide you want to buy some qualitative um, analysis uh, package, um, although you might be able to get it free from your university through like, like in vivo or others. Um, but if you don't, that's gonna cost a lot of money. Going to meet people and do things may cost money. And um, it, it can be complex learning how to use those, those software packages if you want to. It's, it's, it, it can be tough, it can be tough, but it's worth it, I think, in the, in the long run. I mentioned this book earlier, Jim did too. Um, this, this can give you uh, more details on um, some of the things I've talked about today. And I'm finished, thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, Jim, um, uh, I think, think you said you would help field yeah. questions. Yeah, minutes. no, absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah, the, the chat has been alive and active, which is amazing. So there are actually quite a lot of comments and there are some questions and I've been making my notes, trying to put them together. Um, to try to get through them as smoothly as we can and, and appre appreciating some reactions in there from participants on, on this call as well. So yeah, thank you. Um, I, I can pass that on <laughs> to Greg as well. So yeah, Greg, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's so interesting because I think, you know, there, there's so much that happens in the field of applied linguistics where, you know, there are these, the kind of People have their ideas about what they want to explore. I mean, it's like you say, we're applied, right? So it's not, not necessarily driven by theory. And yet, you know, we want to try to inform theory. We're looking for theoretical contributions in our research. So, you know, we have this kind of maybe tendency in certain studies to kind of try to apply theory a little bit later. And grounded mm -hmm. theory <laughs> with its, you know, kind of fuzzy edges, it seems so effective for something like that, right? That you can kind of say, well, you know, I, I, it's, it's really just a completely inductive study. I don't know what I'm going, don't know what to expect in my exploration or investigation. That's grounded theory, right? And so, yeah. <laughs> well, no, actually, it's not inductive. It's abductive. Abductive. Thank you. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I and it's interesting actually because I I raise yeah a whole point about that in in my my book on data collection research methods and applied linguistics about the you know what we're really doing here is abductive. Um, so yeah, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, definitely check the difference between inductive and abductive reasoning for applied linguistics research. Um, but I, what I want to do, because I've got, of course, lots of questions, but we, you and I can chat another time. Um, sure. But I will dig into some of the questions and comments from people uh, that came up in the chat. Um, okay. One of the, well, first of all, you know, one of the big comments that came through was how much everybody loved the slides. So I thought I should pass that oh, on because it's, yes, <laughs> I think that really helped to keep people engaged and awake <laughs> um, for those joining in the wee hours. <laughs> yeah. I should have worked for John Oliver, but no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the production quality here, we're talking, right? Um, okay, so the, um, there were quite a few things around here, you know, in, interesting points um, about how to treat coding. I think that was one of the other really big topics that came up and there was a lot of discussion around it um, with coding and coding software. Um, there were a lot of suggestions in addition to the ones that you had made about transcription that people were kind of engaging with. There was a question, um, you know, there were some supporters of Invivo in there, which I'm familiar with and I use, but there was a question about Max QDA. I don't know if this is one that you use. I know there's also Atlas and there's, you know, so we've, and some other people have made some other suggestions. Um, um, okay. Anything about that? Yeah. Sure. Um, all, all, of, all of the programs, uh, um, InVivo, MaxQDA, and Atlas, and I've used all of them, all three of them. And I keep all, well, I don't use InVivo as much, uh, but basically what, you, what you've got without those is you've got, you know, here on your table, you've got all of your different cards and codes and everything. And you would you'd basically, you'd have to take a picture of it before, you know, you know, your, your office mate kind of walks and opens the window and the wind blows everything away. So uh, the, these, these um, um, programs basically just keep all of your stuff in one place so that you can take it back out and look at it again. Um, the Max QDA 
um, has some advantages in that it has a better a way of dealing with mixed methods research. It has a, a, a statistics package, so you can do um, uh, quantitative research as well. Uh, Atlas uh, TI runs very much like somewhere in between in vivo and um, uh, Max QDA. They have some strengths and, and weaknesses, I suppose. Strengths, for example, with Max QDA is uh, it, once you have, for example, codes or ideas of concepts, you can, they, they have um, a function, and, and well, no, maybe in vivo has it now too, where you can go to Twitter. And Twitter is public speech. And based on those search terms, you can get up to a thousand tweets uh, that have happened in the past week where people may oftentimes, but sometimes not, are actually discussing in short snippets things that you are talking about. And that's, that's an amazing help. Uh, things like that, we have things like that. But all of them do basically the same thing, which you could also do in a Word document. You have your data and you connect the codes for the different pieces that explain possibly what, the, what that data is meaning. Um, and they're great for searching and finding and they can help you to develop new ideas, but they're also hard to run. And you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out how can I get this this thing to connect to this and get really exhausted and uh, use up a lot of your um, uh, creative energy. Now I'm I'm not a, a luddite, you know. You can see I like doing things with technology, and I use the programs themselves. Um, e any of them, either of them are fine. Don't become too attached to them. Take time to pull out, print out the stuff that you're doing, put it on the table, work with it with your hands. And also be careful. I'll tell you the story about what happened with one of the software packages. I won't tell you which one, but um, where I had six years of research on and stuff that I, and I wanted to continue to use parts of it for a new, a new project. But the software company uh, moved up to a new sort of um, architecture. I could not access that six years worth of data. So I wrote to the people, I said, look, do you have any, any way where I can get maybe a middle program or some other way where you can bring it up? And they, they wrote, said, we don't keep archives of our own old software. We're looking to the future. Well, eventually I did some of my, my own digging um, and found a way to bring my data back to life and bring it up to the modern architecture. But when you put too much of your hopes and dreams into these software packages, remember they're there to make money, and it, you, you know you're, they've got your data, and it's to a certain degree. You really want to make sure that you keep access to it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I just lost. I just lost my screen. I know. Anyway. I, I just. I just. I had a, a request to close the screen so that they, so that. They could see you more easily, so I, I went ahead and yeah. <laughs> so it's stuff that's distracting. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. It's distracting. Look at this. Don't listen to me. Look at the twirling thing. Like <laughs> the teacher escapes in the corner. No. <laughs> I've taken away the point. You you actually raised a few other things in connection to some other comments and questions because there was a question um, about. Um, social media and, and, and what that means, which I'll get to in a moment, um, because some of the other things, of course, related to coding and coding software uh, are important. Um, there was a, a comment made around software as a problem, um, saying it determines how what we do, it, 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 yeah, it determines what we, yeah, the way we think about what we do and how we approach the research. What do you think about that? It, it certainly can. Um, and um, uh, they, they, they can't make, um, a software package they try to, that will be flexible enough to be used in so many different ways. They're not used only for grounded theory. They're used for all sorts of other qualitative methodologies. And that's why uh, you, you really should use them if you can. They can save your data and they're very helpful, but keep doing much of it on, the, um, on paper because this is where the grounded theory is actually is, is analyzed and developed. I mean, you'll see in papers it's like my research was analyzed using in vivo software which is like saying my research was uh, written using microsoft word does you know you know the, the software is helpful it's important you need it for for some things but um yeah 
the limitations of the software can limit your uh, capacity to theorize. And that's something you need to keep in mind as you use them. Thank you for that. I know that it's so interesting when I see that coming through, you have people kind of saying analyzed by and then software and you just think, no, no. But it's also interesting. I mean, you raised the point, right? That all that analysis is up in here. And this is one of the biggest issues for a lot of qualitative researchers, right? The reality is we don't know what goes on in a qualitative researcher's mind as far as the analysis goes. Um, but being able to provide some, yeah, it's not systematic necessarily, right? But there's a way of explaining. And, and the uh, software, those software packages can, I mean, can really help. If you oh. do, a, a, I, before, back in the day when the programs weren't as well developed, I would, I would put all of my interviews in, into uh, uh, corp, uh, uh, concordance programs mm -hmm. and study them using them that way to find concepts and keywords and such. And that was very helpful. You can do those, do that now in these programs. They, they can point out some things that you're missing for sure, yeah. definitely. But uh, you don't need them. You see, sometimes these programs are so expensive that they could keep people from doing the research that they could and should be doing. All of the major uh, grounded theory works for the, you know over the maybe the, the first 25, 30 years were done without computers. Yeah, they were just done with <laughs> pens, pencils, papers, and brains, yeah. and a lot of reading. Right, right. But I think that's maybe that's the part that you know I don't know people maybe relying too much on it, thinking it does more for them than they realize when actually, yeah, it should all be up in here anyway. Yeah. Um, a couple of other questions in relation to coding, just really quickly, because the questions around when do you know how to stop coding? Um, <laughs> what do you do with hundreds of codes? How do you merge them? When, 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 you st when you're coding and uh, you're in the beginning and you get somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50 to 75 different codes some of them are going to be kind of, kind of similar stop mm. and at that point take take some periods of of consolidating those codes some of these are going to be you'll just take them out put them on a piece of paper cut them in little bits put them on the table and start putting them into groups where they seem to have something in common and start writing labels uh, that would encapsulate those and then write memos about each of those explaining why this is done and then there's going to be some that seem like you know they're not so important. You can put them in an envelope. Don't throw them away. Put them in an envelope. Put them aside, and start using those codes. And you might start making some more new ones as you do a few more interviews. But by the time you get to around a hundred open codes, you've got too many, you know, and you're not going to be able to code everything. So you start to get some things that are rather um, seem to be happening a lot, uh, that seem to be significant, and you work with that. Later on, you might find something new that opens up and you go back, but, but you're just, you got to try to let, let go of the ring Frodo, so to speak, and, and let go of some of the stuff that you really think, oh, I, I must, I must, I must know my precious, my, no, no, put it away. It's, it's, it's going to burn you. So um, just work with this stuff that you build up um, over time. Um, and yeah, that's what you've got to do. Yeah. Is, I've got 300 codes as well. Let's start working with the first 50. Uh, okay. So, this is so good. It's so nice for you to offer some numbers because I think there are quite a lot of people who appreciate that thinking, right, okay, you know, Professor Hadley said no more than 75, I'm going to stop. I mean, you really do have to stop. And I think there's a point to where, you know, as researchers, we need to trust ourselves to recognize that, you know, a lot of this is subjective interpretive, you know, so, okay, I reached, you know, a point to where, you know, I need to trust myself with what I found up to this point and work with this. Maybe. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Um, okay. Comparison. We need to find somebody now who disagrees with us. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> what we're saying, see? Saying, I was going to say, because, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So it's say, the <laughs> keep, the chat, keep the chat going, because, yeah, we're, get, we're getting some, if anybody disagrees with anything at any point, please do put that in the chat, because that'll, yeah, make some point. I mean, we, we do only have a few minutes left and quite a lot of questions to get through. Um, let, let's see what we can do. There was a question. Um, this is actually from Ruani. Um, and it was in relation to social media. So you'd mentioned Twitter earlier. A few people were mentioning things about Twitter in relation to some of the coding. Um, so his question was around, um, yeah, how, how does social media mediate doing grounded theory method? Uh, are there fundamental adjustments for working mainly online? <sighs> well, you get a lot of, you, you can get a lot more uh, words but you may not always get uh, enough meaning. 
the, you, if you have interaction like this, it, 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 it's okay, it's better. But actually being with the person and talking with them face to face, if you're going to do interviews, you get a lot more from that, a lot more from that. Sometimes uh, we try to approach qu uh, qualitative research with, with quantitative desires. Like I'm going to get yeah. 1,000 tweets. That makes it better. It doesn't necessarily make it better. Uh, it, it, it might add complexity, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going on before and after that that you're not going to touch. And even if we're typing back and forth uh, in a chat, uh, doing an interview that way, oh, that's great. You get an automatic um, transcription. It's helpful. Oh. But there's a lot more that's going on, like the body language when you ask someone they're doing this, you know, where they're banging the table as they're talking, where they've got a tear in their eye. Oh. You don't see that. And that opens up doors for, for new discovery. So we're talking about primarily qualitative research. Uh, and the internet doesn't, I'm going to sound like an old man wearing a tweed jacket and hair coming out of my ears, right? It doesn't work as good as it did in the old days. Well, yeah, it, it, it helps. But you still need that, <laughs> you still need that human interaction face-to-face uh, -face up front for there to be real quality that go into that qualitative research. I'm Does so happy to hear you say that. I think so, yeah. Because I think this is part of it, right? I mean, we've got these points to where, I don't know, with COVID especially, right? I mean, there's so much that we try to do online and some people are you know, making adjustments to some of their data collection and the idea that, you know, oh, well, maybe if I have this more quantitative element, it'll kind of make up for something that's otherwise missing in these other elements. But I, yeah, I think, I fully agree with what you're saying. You know, all you can eat restaurant or a French meal. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, is there both food, you know, or a gas station burrito and, uh, you know, a burrito that's eaten in Mexico. Um, you know, what we're doing online a lot of times is the gas station burrito. That's an American phrase, you know. Uh, it's cup ramen and instead of cup noodle, instead of a pot noodles, instead of the, the thing. It feeds you. It's sufficient but there's an issue of quality that can come if you can get closer to the people. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, you're, you're making me hungry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lead up to lunch. Gas station burrito, uh, I weep for you. Is it I, food I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to assume that it wouldn't be easy for me to find one in London, but yeah, who, know, who knows? Um, so yeah, I realize that we're quickly running out of time. There were some other comments um, that were raised the, um, book by Saldana on, on coding was recommended by a couple of people uh, in relation yeah, to using cool. gerunds for open coding, thinking about process coding. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that. Um, okay. Yeah, the, the other kind of bigger questions um, that we didn't really get to, but maybe if you just, I'll, I'll just kind of group them together as a way of kind of closing this out. Okay. Um, but the, there was a, a big question around the role of research questions throughout the grounded theory process as well as thinking about, I don't know, deciphering or thinking about the relationship between ethnography and grounded theory. It's okay, yeah. Um, well, I'll put aside the point of ethnography because that's more of an issue of describing what's going on within a certain group of people. And okay. grounded theory does work with descriptive in the beginning, but it doesn't stay there. It moves on into interpretations. But, you know, this issue of the question before you go out um, is a big, a big thing amongst the methodologists. Um, uh, Glazer and people that are in that sort of way of thinking think, well, you got to be open because if you have any sort of question, then you're going to miss something that is probably going on, but your, your fixation on the, on the literature has kept you from seeing something significant, a, a major discovery. Okay, there's some truth to that, but he was, um, he was a well-read soci. Well, he's still alive. He is a well-read sociologist uh, and has a, a broad a view of, of things. So that's that's okay. Maybe the idea of not having any questions it works if you're an expert in some area. But if you're a student, a PhD student, and you're learning, uh, Strauss, who spent a lot more time in education, he said, "Hey, it's okay to develop some general questions about what you would like to learn about." and to go into the field and try to explore those things first. And if you find out that's not really working, you might discover something else later on. But it's okay, he would say, to read a little bit more before you go in, get some ideas and some questions, some, some areas of interest that pique your curiosity. So if you 
you know, or if you're, you don't know what you really want to do, it's okay. Uh, certain, some grounded theorists, uh, Charmez, Kathy Charmez as well said the same thing. Go ahead and read some stuff, get some knowledge. Don't, don't go out and reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you will be able to develop maybe a good uh, explanation that will be helpful. It may not be groundbreaking, but it still might make a contribution. If you're an expert and you've read a lot, you're maybe older and you've had a lot more life experiences, you might want to try to pull back from all of that that has encrusted you um, and see if you can learn something new. So grounded theory has something for younger researchers, but it also has uh, opportunities for older researchers as well. Oh, I love the way you responded to that, because I think it's, you know, there, there are kind of bigger questions around where research questions you know, kind of fit into this kind of research. Do we wait you know, to, to kind of explore before we actually form a question? Do we lead with a question? You know, it's, it's interesting thinking about really the impact comes from ourselves you know, and our, our own kind of personal. Uh, For PhD students, who, you know, you'll have to PhD students need to write uh, a um, uh, proposal. Hmm. Which, which means they have to put up questions and ideas up front. And what, what happens, if they can even get permission to use grounded theory, depending on the department, right. is that they still need to, and, they're, and modern grounded theory methodology books have ways of writing uh, uh, proposals for PhD committees on this, where you can define the area that you're interested in, some possible questions you seek to explore, but also let them know that as this is an open-ended exploratory form of research, new questions may, may develop and you can work with that committee or ethics committee or whatever committee is there to control the process uh, as these come up to see if this, these can continue to be explored in light of new discoveries. Oh, fantastic advice. Thank you, Greg. I, I am going to stop it, which is a shame because there really are some really good questions still remaining. But I think that I think this, you know, I think a discussion like this can go on for quite some time, right? I mean, yeah, questions here about how to make um, grounded theory more popular and palatable, particularly in hostile environments. Questions about you know how to deal with grounded theory not as an analysis of themes. What do we think about ideas about partial forms of grounded theory? There's a lot here to think about. Um, so basically what I'm going to recommend to everyone whose question um, I didn't get to, and I apologize, um, is definitely check out um, some, some of the, the readings that were suggested there. You've got some links to some things. Um, we did get a helpful link to the, the bigger reading where we've got your, um, the article that you were referring to earlier. So uh, please do check those and you should be able to find a lot of um, helpful, helpful responses to some of your questions there. Um, Greg, any other opportunities for people to engage in discussions around grounded theory? Well, um, in the, um, it's possible later this year um, or early next year that the, uh, I'll be doing another uh, online uh, workshop uh, through Kellogg College. Okay. Um, and um, that would probably be limited to about 25 people or so, right. but that would be a, it's designed for training people who are PhD students or PhD supervisors or uh, new researchers, when you use that. Um, we're in the process of getting things set up with that. I'll probably put something out on social media and see, you know, if anybody's interested, you know, then uh, they can they can sign up for that. that that'll be in the immediate future. But after, after the pandemic is over, really over, then I would be happy to do uh, more workshops because it, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, a, a kung fu magazine. You know, you've been reading this kung fu magazine. You think, oh yeah, and you go out and you get beaten up, right? Because something happens. So you need to have a workshop where you can work with other brilliant people, share your ideas, share what you're doing with the research, and and work with it. That that really helps people make forward momentum on their research. I would say, and it's not just me. There there are other grounded theory workshops being run all over uh, the world. So I mean this. Not just yeah. me. So, to, so check those out. All right. And of course, um, you know, I'll, I'll just stop the recording there. Um, so 